So, ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, please. I think it's probably time we, we, we started. So, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this event on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, whose sign is there, which I founded uh, at Edinburgh University 12 years ago. And um, our mission is to educate and inspire future leaders through building their understanding of Pan-Asia, with which the Scots have had historically such very strong connections. Indeed, there's hardly a family in Scotland that can't trace some sort of link, uh, if not initially to the United States, then later to Asia. And we are absolutely delighted to host Bashirpi Fraser, who will discuss her two recent poetry collections, Habitat and Patient Dignity. Just a few words on poetry, because I think that that's important. Poetry has been described as a bridge, an immediate path to becoming better people and being the change in the world, creating a world less about tear tearing each other down and apart and more about coming together, helping us to realize that we are not as different as we think. And despite our differences, we are not alone in our grief, pain, joy, or happiness. Reading and writing poetry is the greater good, whose benefits are the rebuilding and forging a more connected and caring world. We inhabit everything that comes our way, people, places, nature. Writing itself is our habitat, and it is this space that Basha B. Fraser explores in her collection of the same name. These poems, as you will discover, challenge our understanding of rules and form when it comes to poetry. Basha B. plays with the duality that her life has instructed her with, through having lived in two different countries, experiencing two different cultures, yet allowing the parallels to still come through. At its core, the collection is about our journeys, where we have been, where we are going, and what we are moving through. It is all about our habitats and our connection to them. As someone wrote, one of the effects of the climate crisis has been the vitality of a poetry that is decidedly public-facing, a poetry whose urgency often dispenses with the page. The tensions behind such a development run through habitat. The core of the collection may be found in personal encounters, but its argument extends far beyond that. The habitat, the community of which Basha B. Fraser writes, encompasses all living things. It is a book rich in praise, but also freighted with warning. As many of you, but not necessarily everyone will know, Dr. Basha B. Fraser, CBE, Henri FASL, is an award-winning poet, children's writer, translator, editor, and academic. She is Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing in Edinburgh's Napier, in Edinburgh Napier University and co-founder and a director of the Scottish Centre of Tagore Studies. Basha B. has written and edited 25 books, published several articles and chapters in international journals and books, and has been widely anthologized as a poet. She was declared in 2015 an outstanding woman of Scotland by the Saltai Society. And so I feel that Bashabi needs no more greater introduction, but we are so delighted that you're here. And the Asia Scotland Institute is thrilled to have this opportunity of talking with you. Thank you. So Bashabi, we're, we're thrilled to have you here with us today. And I'd like you to tell me what got you going on writing poetry and when was that? It's actually, um, it sounds very stupid, but I started writing when I was seven years old. Uh, here in London, here in London, well, here in Britain, in London, not in Scotland. And uh, it was because my 
parents were at the London School of Economics, and my father was India's first Commonwealth scholar uh, to Britain. And so I was writing for... Can you hear at the back? Okay, I'll stand up and say, okay. It was just, Roddy was asking when I started writing poetry. I have to say that it is, uh, my answer is a stupid one because I started writing at seven. What do you know about poetry when you're seven? You like the rhyme, you like the rhythm, uh, but you don't escape the bad spelling. So uh, I was writing for a British Council officer, Julian Dakin, who was looking after my parents, who were both at LSE, London School of Economics, and he brought me books, Julian. And I read, I, I, he read to me, and I love poetry. And I wrote for Julian. So that's how I started writing poetry. He took them away, and he brought back the Commonwealth Scholar Journal. And at seven, I had won the first prize. And I wasn't a Commonwealth Scholar. I was only seven. And I can tell you that only Julian and my parents would value such bad poetry. So that's when I just started writing and kept on writing. Wonderful. There are two volumes we have here, and I wonder if we could start off by looking at patient dignity. And maybe you'd like to choose some things that you'd like to read from that. When COVID hit us, I, we were all confined. We were all prisoners. And that's when I started writing this book, the poems in this book. And my publisher uh, was Scotland Street Press. Uh, they do books, beautiful books with um, paintings. So I am very grateful to Vibha Pankaj, who's here, for agreeing to do the painting. So I just sent her the poems, and she would paint uh, responding to the poetry. They're not illustrations, they're uh, poems in their own right. So I is it okay, Roddy, if I read a bit from Vibha's forward? I think that'd be lovely. Yeah. So, thank you. My inspiration for paintings comes from my childhood. The stories I heard about man's relationship with the environment and the animal kingdom, and from the time spent in places with abundant natural beauty, and she mentions the foothills of the Himalayas, which we share. We both grew up there. Walks on Scottish hills reignited my deep-rooted connection with nature. Its offer of hope, comfort, freedom, and unconditional friendship. And I think that's what kept both of us going, that nature would be there for us to nurture us, sustain us, and that there was hope. So we lived in hope, both of us. So thank you, Vibha. And that is uh, what I'll begin with. Do you want me to read a couple of poems from here? Yes, to start off with, that'd be lovely. Well, I'm going to read uh, the end of a poem, which is the first poem in the book, Post-Truth Era. And I deeply hope Trump doesn't come back. <laughs> So while all this happens, but somewhere in this chasmed world, an old familiar song floats free. Remember, I'll always be true. And when I'm away, I'll write home every day, and I'll send you all my, all my loving to you, and hope that my dreams will come true. Many of us with gray hair here have grown up with this song. A song freed from the shackles of untruth. It rises above alleys, it dances over valleys. It comes like a mist unfurled. It brings the radiance of hope in these dark times when we grope for a world which we knew, where, lo where love of me for you was unchallenged and true. Lovely. I remember when we talked about one of the side effects of COVID, was since we were all shut up inside, mostly, and there were very few cars moving around, we suddenly realized how birdsong was more noticeable. It was quite extraordinary. And I know you and I have talked about that. Did you write a poem about that at all? 
about bird song? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I wrote plenty of points about bird song. Which one would you like me to read? <laughs> I think I'll read one that. Um, <coughs> you can read them both if there are two or more. Uh, if you'd like to. Yeah, well, I was. There was one poem that Roddy, you mentioned, I think. And uh, I'm just trying to find it. It's. Um, There's At Home with Sparrows, isn't there? I was going to read that, and there's also... Okay. It's on page was, 70. Yeah. Here are. Thank you. Um, one thing about sparrows is that they followed me everywhere. And wherever they are, I feel at home. At home with sparrows. They nested in our ventilators and invested in cotton balls and wool ends from my mother's work basket to line their straw walls. They were busy and boisterous, a joyous community, curious about everything, quick-witted, agile, bold, and uproarious. Up before the first light, their flutter unmistakable, their chatter was constant, convivial, and reliable. When we moved, from the foothills to the congestion of a city, they were there as a reminder of small needs and beauty. They cradled in the branches across our balcony perches, their voices softer, their flurries swifter, cautious and nervous of furtive chases. You can see why they're furtive and cautious. This is Calcutta. But still willing visitors to our windowsill, for bird seed, raisins, breadcrumbs, and water, chirping and rocking between feeds. And when we crossed continents, I thought I had lost my mainstay, my loyal defenders, my little companions, my light-footed watchmen by day. But in this mountainous hedge that shuts the vast world out, they have built their sheltered home where other colonies sprout of tits and finches and robins who emerge with hopping grace to accept our humble offerings and disappear without a trace when hulking gulls appear. But I know they are still there for where they choose to build their nest, I can find rest as their invited guest. Lovely. I'm going to read another one about birds. That's beautiful. Well, I, th I thought I might uh, yeah. You chose a poem. Shall I read that? Yes, why don't you? That would be lovely. In self-isolation. You remember when you had to self-isolate? And we used to walk in our garden because we were not allowed out. Neil called it our prison yard. Uh, you know, where prisoners are let out. I thought it was the best thing we had because for a long time we had no idea how beautiful our garden was. And every time one swathe of flowers faded, I thought that's the end, no more color. And then other flowers came, which was wonderful. So, in self-isolation, I lift my gaze above the fence and have the solace of a hill, framing my southern vision, stolid, supine, and still. You know which one this is, Arthur's seat. I look beside our garden path. I see the magic of the woods, transported in bluebell clusters, lifting the blackbird's mood. I wonder at our cherry tree, its adolescence, adolescent abundance mirroring the tree-lined meadows, reveling in the spring's radiance. I cannot hear the gurgling burn, the waves collapsing on the shore, but bobbing pigeons greet and welcome me at my door. There are blackbirds there, and there are pigeons there. Right. Uh, well... A pigeon is not a birdie bird. 
but it's still there. That's beautiful. Have you, since the ending of, of COVID, have you noticed other changes that have spurred you to write about things? And are some of those in Habitat? Some of them are in Habitat. I was just wondering before I move on, I wondered if Roddy would like me to read the one when things hadn't moved on to my grandson. Indeed. Because be I didn't see him. No. You know. yeah. Well, his mom rang me in March 2020 and said, Mom, he's just taken his first steps. And I said, good, I can come and watch him walk. And then I thought, no, it's lockdown. I can't see him, right? So I didn't see him for six months. And then maybe another six months after that. So this is to my little Louis, which has changed. And we do do all the things I had planned now. And this is page 88 for those following it. When all this is over, to Louis. I could not be there to watch you take your first steps and feel your joy of walking at full tilt on each waking day. I could not be with you when you helped Mama and Papa to blow out the candle on your first birthday. You nod to me at FaceTime with obvious recognition. You rock for me at showtime with serious concentration. You point to the pigeons as I share your fascination. I watch the sky with you as they seek their destination. But one day, when all this is over, we will walk away together, your little hand in my clasp. We will watch the swans gather at the edge of the lake to welcome little Louis with the ducks and the drakes. We'll run through the fields of sunny daffodils. We'll play hide and seek in caverns and creeks. We'll sail away far. We'll whisper to stars. We'll muck in the garden. And all of a sudden, if the rain comes down, we'll scamper back home. We'll sprinkle and shower the kitchen with flour. You will help me to bake your best fairy cakes. And I'll tell you a story of a dragon and fairy whom you can chase in your dreams over mountains and streams. They will bring you your wings and many magical things which we'll explore and enjoy when my Louis and I can meet once more and play as we did before. And I play with him very frequently now. Lovely. If we turn to Habitat, I will unashamedly quote from the wonderful introduction written by Joyce Kaplan. Joyce. She says, before we dip into the volume, these poems are about writing itself, from the prologue to the epilogue, how we fill the white space with words that describe and recreate the worlds around us, our habitat. They challenge form and perception by abandoning punctuation <laughs> to free meaning and us to a myriad of interpretations. In this strange post-pandemic time, it reminds us all that our normal markers have been erased. Yet the poems are also embedded firmly in place and our response to it. Fluttering like a hundred doves in flight, wanting to alight with the call of home. The world of nature in these poems continues thriving and adapting. Birds, cats, forest animals, the sea, the winds, all survive despite our greed and exploitation that destroy many habitats, including our own with indifference. Bashabi has lived in two countries and this duality informs her writing with both parallels and divergence. We have peacocks in Scotland and India, and we are taken into their spaces with intense observation and empathy. Thank you. So take us into Habitat and choose a poem, or two or three poems that you would like to read to us. <laughs> 
I'll read one to a fellow poet who died very suddenly. Uh, I was a Royal Literary Fund Fellow in the University of Dundee, and Jim Stewart, a lovely human being, taught there. So when he died, there was this page script, and I was asked to write a poem to Jim, and I think it fits Habitat, for Jim stood for all this. Let us ring in the change. Let us work out our white magic to roll back the ocean and whisper to islands that don't see the sun. Let us bid them to rise and unfold their green mantle, rustle with life and greet the horizon. Let us tingle the heartstrings of Sarud and Esraj to charm back the forests that we slashed down and burnt. Let us silence the dark dirge of desert and, sh and shorn hills and fill them with music of willow and birch. Let us dance with the peacocks to beckon the storm clouds, to swell every stream and ripple the lakes. Let us push back the concrete and lift the smog curtain to send out a message for the wild wind to awake. Let us bring back a smile to the wan moon above who will know that her beloved planet will live. That's lovely. Would you like to read from page 34, The Guest, in a house in North Kolkata? With pleasure. For those of you who have been to Calcutta, uh, it's quite interesting because the Ganga flows close by, or the Hooghly. But a lot of the time you don't know it. But if you're in North Calcutta, you feel the breeze when the sun is going down. But if there's a storm, that's it. And we were in a house in North Calcutta, and this is what happened. There was a little bird that flew in. The guest in a house in North Calcutta. This wayward wind that whizzes past motley buildings of diverse heights, tearing through winding streets that jostle between times, fragmented memories, tells me that the Ganga flows somewhere close by, sending dismissive of its reviving reality. This is the wind I miss as I travel further south to a part of the city where Ganga seems a myth. But as I stand here on this narrow balcony, which cradles this house like a comforting arm, I'm surprised by a gift born by this wind of a yellow budgeriga, bright as new corn, the kiss of the golden sun on its feathers, who chooses my balustrade to rest from its stormy ride. Where have you come from, my little bird, bearing a missive? from Ganga's whispering breast? Why do you let me speak to you? And why do you hop willingly onto my outstretched arm, a consenting prisoner or a gracious guest, choosing my proffered cage as your place of rest? And you stay with me, happy to flit around your bounded world while the wind capers free. Is it because you are tired of being whisked like the polish blossoms and the mango mongery by a wanton wind released from Ganga's breast? Here we will sing together, content with the certainty of regular meals and rest. Not threatened by the he heady tide of a thoughtless wind that rules the tide as the Ganga flows wide to greet the bay where the sky stoops down and storms begin. Very beautiful. Thank you. You don't, you don't have to feel, you have to clap. But if you do, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
read some others from Habitat. You choose them. Um, are there any that anyone would like? Would you, is there one that anyone would like me to read? Or shall I just carry on? Page 50, okay, the crow. Yeah. This is to the artist Joyce Gunn Cairns, who's a good friend, and she sketches a lot of corbs. Thank you, dear. Black robed scavenger, fond of bare branches nearest the gray clad sky, sitting on a slippery electric line, a wretched spectacle waiting to dry. The world of color bypassed your feathers. You were born a clumsy, naked lump of flesh in a flimsy, unpretentious nest. Not beautiful, nothing to boast of. A hungry little shriveled soul screeching with a voice not melodious for food. Small specks of precious booty that your sooty, winged mother stole. Your eggs were hatched along with the cuckoos, watched over with maternal care by a fastidious mother, fed, taught to fly by a species shunned by all. At first it was a clumsy attempt, not an artistic smooth journey, but a repeated beating of wings, breathless trying flights to the nearest windowsill, till one day well-schooled in the art, you left your uncomfortable abode, ready to befriend any bird, any man, but always avoided, unwanted, yet necessary for society to clear its discarded waste in bins and street piles before the clearing lorry's invasion. We have a strike going on, by the way. We could do with more crows. Mm. Gliding through life as best as you can, Nobody wants you, adroit little thief, yet we do need you, astute little bird, leaving our garbage for you to clear between rubbish collection days, yet unflinchingly we shoo you away and compel you to trust to your wings and flee. It is an endless search for the edible, a continuous flight from one human community to another a forlorn, watchful, resourceful being, sensitive to the most unnoticeable lift of the little finger. You flit away in a lightning flash to, come to find company with your own clan. Thus you spend sunny days, rainy days, endless days, the herald of each newborn day, a horse, broken, reed, alto, a fascinating, swift, unostentatious crooner, a grey-crested, black crow, friendless scavenger. I love crows. If you turn the page, um, I think we get to the sprightly sparrow. Would you like to read that? Of course. It's another sparrow poem. The sprightly sparrow. And it's dedicated to? Devnarayan Bandupadhyay. Yeah, I should have said that. He is a, a long-time friend and has and actually introduced Scottish studies in Bakura University in India. Can one analyze the frolicsome maneuver with which you flash by from branch to meadow with your ever-changing shadow to accompany you as you flit or float or fly? The azure void above entrances you. The gay, tripping water enhances your cries. The verdant green is dear, but dearer by far is the telegraph, telephone line between the two worlds. We did have telephone lines before. A peck at this petal, a glance to the right, a flurry as you scurry by. The soft thud of berries as you alight on a branch and a commotion of rustling as you hurry by. When a companion exasperates you, you never tire of speaking your mind. Wings flutter, feathers scatter in a noisy aerial combat, shrieking and screeching and swinging around till a general crow 
calls for order, and two guilty lieutenants hastily hmm. depart. An unanticipated shower exasperates you, for it hurts your inherent dignity to be seen in your ragged misery, dripping and helpless on a glistening lawn. When in slumber, when deep in slumber, I am awakened by the sudden kiss of a straw and open my eyes to gaze at two bright beady eyes inspecting me below. Having lost your way amidst your spring task of building your abode, an untidy piece of workmanship for a sprightly, charming bird. Your seemingly carefree days are crowded with your active ways to survive and thrive in your tiny phase of life that witnesses the lives of men and women who trudge through pain, suffer heat, and wait for the rain, who never stop to look askance at a playful speck of life which seems beyond their care and strife. A presence which traverses the sky, heralds the dawn, twitters incessantly, rocks the corn, whom footsteps astound and fireworks confound, a lovable little symbol of caprice, darting and flitting through life like a breeze. Bashabi, would, should we get people to ask questions? I think there may be budding poets in here, or poets, or writers, who I know would like to, to ask you some questions, and then we'll do some more reading after that. So if you'd like to say who you are, Bashabi may well know who you are, and, and ask a question. Who'd like to start? Yes. Um. I'm always interested in people that in more than one culture, and it used to be thought that um, one of the exercises for something that's just hit full of evenings or evenings that have to be written. Prior to that, it's really the discipline of translating from another culture to language. So, uh, my question really is that. Um, um, and I know you're sort of seeing the work of Tagore, which is probably all of the conversion, but um, can you tell us about the early days when you've been found translation from other than your own beautiful languages of Asia to the King Valley? And then they had oil and I took translation in the United States from another culture from your own other languages. Um, I, I am, I have translated, I am a translator, but I'm more a translator of prose. I'm a bit scared to translate poetry. I did translate a poem by Shi Tao, uh, a Chinese poet who was imprisoned into Bengali. I don't have it with me. I'll send it to you. And uh, it, it was during the Olympian torch journey. And uh, Shi Tao's poem, June, was read in every city that the torch passed through. And it was meant to be translated into 27 poems. And in the end, it was uh, translated into 127. So the, I did the Bengali one. And my Bengali friends uh, think it is quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have been influenced by Rabindranath, but I think I was, I've also uh, had, the, uh, I had the privilege of going back to India when my parents went back. So I, I grew up with Bengali and Hindi. Uh, my Hindi isn't wonderful, but I can read Hindi, write Hindi and speak, uh, though I get mixed up with the gender. So I do read poems in Hindi. Uh, I read a lot of modern writers, but I feel that there are some timeless writers. And especially I find 
Bengali poetry creeping into my own work, Kazi Nozrul Islam, Rabindranath Tagore, amongst others. And uh, today we have modern writers like Joy Goshami and uh, um, so all that influences me a lot. But I think uh, I continue to write in English because when I went back, there was no support teaching for Bengali or Hindi. So I, I just struggled on. I was thrown at the deep end. Uh, I did do quite well in Bengali at the end, but uh, with no proper confidence. So my, the language of cre creativity, of expression, remains English, but I remain grateful for having this access through English to other poets, you know, like, like um, Neruda and Pushkin, and the list is long. So, you know, uh, and uh, Bengali modernism was also very influenced uh, by Baudelaire. So that also comes back, you know, it goes there, comes back. And these are the waves that have flown over me and continue to right. help me to compose. I don't know if I answered your question, Eric. With nicely around the houses. <laughs> More questions from the audience? Well, what? Yes. Sorry. It's all right. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite understand the first question, but how can you translate it from Oh, I didn't translate from the Chinese poem. I translated from Chip Rowley's uh, poem, uh, tr uh, translated into English. And most of us did that right across the world. And I must say that I have some Scottish pen members here. Uh, I'm very proud to say we adopted Chi Tao as an honorary member we campaigned for him, and he was set free. You can clap for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good question. So, I Bashabi, who would you say amongst the English, British poets influenced you? People like Gerard Manley Hopkins? Of course, like, his of religious course. poetry, yeah. Very much so, his mm -hmm. spiritual poetry, <clears throat> yeah. yes. Too clever. He was wonderful. I mean, everybody knows Easter wings, if nothing else. Um, I think, oh, loads. I, I, I like the romantic poets. I like, uh, yes, and um, Shakespeare's always there, you know, behind us, one of the greatest. Uh, today in Scotland, Scotland is very rich with poetry. Uh, a, a lot of excellent poets here. Eddie Morgan, who should have got the, uh, Nobel Prize, but didn't, died too soon. Uh, but uh, um, who have I been influenced by? Well, a lot of women writers as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, L Like who, for example? There I say Charlotte Smith, uh, who, who was never anthologized in romantic anthologies because women weren't. Mm. Um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Yes. Mm. Uh, Sylvia Plath. Marion Moore. Emily Dickinson. Uh, and the list is long. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Gentleman at the back. Yes, yeah, so probably, probably um, labels of this study with you. Given the topic of translation, uh, and the going beyond the real moment of medicine. The other great challenge of this field would be that all the great issues that is rooted in the entire human culture and violence and so forth. So, do you find that uh, challenge by translating the truth from one, not just language, but the culture to another language, another culture, and sort of present in all these ways and Perceived not just the words, but also the behind the words. Yes, how you Um I think uh, it's quite interesting. Once there was a, uh, a Tamil writer who came to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Good question. And uh, uh, she was asked why she hadn't uh, 
provided a glossary. And she said, look, when we read Jane Austen or Dickens, nobody provided us a glossary. And we just enjoyed the novels as they were. So try to just feel comfortable and find the meaning of the word from the context. And I think that was a very good wake-up call for a lot of us writers that, yes, uh, you can have a glossary, which I do. I mean, I have a big book I edited, Bengal Partition Stories, an unclosed chapter, uh, where 39 famous writers from both sides of the, the border, both women and men and Hindu and Muslim, had their stories translated, and I had a raft of wonderful seven women writers. I didn't start off with wanting to have women, but somehow it happened. But we did provide a glossary, and they were very sensitive. I, I translated some of the stories, but everybody was very sensitive to the fact that the cultural context needed to be apparent to the writer beyond Bengal, and across the world, but also to keep in mind that they were writing for an English-speaking audience who had their own expectations and own idea of um, the style. So I, I don't think I would do what, uh, I have, haven't written a novel yet, but I, anyway, I won't go into that. But what Rushdie does is quite interesting when he provides the translation, mm. you know, the gudam, the go down, uh, the store, warehouse. So it can be done, it can be embedded without having a glossary. It can be done within the context. And I think a lot of us try and do that, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, is it something like when you translate and you say that it's a little bit of a big way and in the close where the translation is you know, beyond the language and the culture of the different uh, region? So, in terms of weight, or maybe in some of those experimental tools where there's a creative use of the words or the phrasing, so do you think that? When you translate and it could be difficult to you may not be that familiar with the people from other cultures, they don't have any theory. So, so to get to it, like, how do you do that sort of thing where yeah, it is very difficult uh, to express that um, context to someone? Um, yeah, I mean, translate, good professional translators would take all that on board. I don't consider myself a professional translator, but I, I, I love to take literature across the borders of language. So that's my mission. I think Tagore solved it himself when he wrote the Gitanjali pro poems, which were prose. And, the, and you'll find that some of the poems are much shorter than the Bengali version. And that's very important to know what not to offer a literary translation. I have done one, uh, I, I was part of a book, book project, it's called Scots Beneath the Banyan Tree, Stories from Bengal. And it was done with, a, with, a, um, with an artist uh, whom we call a potua, so it's the scroll painting. Now, he sings his lyrics, right? So his lyrics in Bengali, he sent to me. So you open the scroll, you have the lives of William Roxborough, David, uh, Don, uh, um, Daniel Hamilton, uh, you have uh, Patrick Geddes, uh, etc. And then you turn it over, the scroll, and you have the lyrics. And what I have done, and I hope I've done justice to Guru Pada Chitrakar, absolutely humbling working with him, so talented, so multi-talented. What I did was I kept the rhyme. I kept the rhythm. If he had couplets, I translated them into couplets. If he had, uh, if, if he had, instead, if he had triplets, 
I translated it into triplets. So if you go to the National Library, it was a limited edition. Uh, you can still read the lyrics. And we can have a chat about that afterwards, whether I have done justice to Guru Padur. Bless him. He has died. But I, I would also, there are a lot of computer buffs here. If anyone would like to do another edition of this wonderful book and keep Guru Pada alive, because a lot of people were involved in this book. It's a, a, an artist book. I, I was just the editor and, yeah, translator and researcher, but there are others. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. I don't write poetry in Bangla, so the answer is no, but I've had my poems translated in Bangla. Good question. Yeah, yes. There's Can another you? question here. Yep. Yeah. Um, just to bring it back to the translation, please. Oh, because I'm going to primarily do a poem. And uh, being, um, before you could get, so, my question is really, where do people go? Earlier on, correct me if I'm wrong, earlier on, I would say that you, know, you were very much involved with themes of identity and the Scottish, the uh, Indian, coming together as a big part, who are one of you, whatever. And I think there's been a sudden change sort of more recently. Well, I think Scotland and India will continue to play a part always. I mean, my two, I, I, I carry them like a portmanteau uh, with me. Uh, and this began long ago, as you know, in, uh, from my introduction, Gonga to the Tay, I explain it. Uh, but I'm more and more worried about the climate. I'm worried about conflict. I'm worried about divisive politics. Uh, I'm worried about the lack of freedoms in certain societies. I'm worried about women's empowerment. So a lot of that has creeped into my poetry. And when, when I did my first book, Life, um, I was told by the then Consul General that I can't ask the High Commission, Indian High Commissioner to, to launch this because it's too political. And, hmm. and I thought, well, poets are political. You know, how can you not be political? Because you're aware of, of what is happening and you, you are, you are voicing what a society feels, thinks. But then the High Commissioner was given my book. And from the plane to the book festival, he read it. And he got off the plane and he said, I'm going to launch this book. So he didn't seem to mind. But I think it, it began some time ago. I think my next two books are going to be quite different. But climate change will never go away. Because that's what we are facing. The threat to the planet, to life on Earth. Yep. Well, like, do, do you see those those things about climate change and women's rights? Do you see that being a concern for the India for people who maybe have been grown up in India or don't have the dual nationality? Do you see that in the Indian psyche that that is a problem? That they see that as a problem as well? Or is that? Well, one thing about India is that. There are many Indians. I mean, there's so many different uh, communities and, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that it's villages and cities. Even villages can be quite, lib you know, women can be quite feisty there and take over. So uh, I, I think we, uh, I think they're interrelated because, um, I'll give you one example, partition. When the partition of India happened, my family on both sides came from the eastern part. They had their lands, they had, the women had their kitchens, which were the place where the family met. So you had a courtyard, and then you had rooms all around, 
and at one end of the one side of the courtyard was the kitchen and meal times everybody would go there sit on uh, on wooden stools or, or rugs and eat close to the floor and that was the meeting place when partition happened women lost their kitchens women nobody thought of them it, they, uh, you know where would they cook and yet people needed their sustenance women were cooking under the staircase women were cooking on the balcony women were cooking in the courtyard their kitchen was gone these are the women who entered the marketplace they were the ones who sought employment they changed the face of society partition had its bad side but partition also just like your the two wars here brought women out into factories and they drove trams and buses and everything the same happened after partition my mother and all her sisters worked and that wouldn't have happened if partition hadn't happened because they were pushed into a corner and they fought back and i think they continue to fight back in there's, countries like india there's a lady with a question down there yep yeah Everybody's busy. <laughs> yeah. again a very good question um i think i muddle along a bit and uh, i don't do anything very well i try to juggle things uh and what you see is the end product like a book but you have no idea how it came about and what struggles went into it i think i work under pressure very well so if people say i have to like uh, right now i'm writing a chapter for a bloomsbury edition it's driving me mad but i i have to submit it by the end of june and that keeps me going poetry i write because i'm disturbed into writing and i usually write at night and i'm very uh, when neil is snoring away so, so so he's not even a witness but he can get up and say are you writing now so poetry can be folded into your life whenever you want to but other other things you have to write under pressure i'll give one example and that is when i was writing my tagore book i would get up in the morning and i was constantly disturbed by things and uh, you know by it would be 10 am and i still had written a line and then my father who sat at the other end other side of the secretary table in calcutta who also writes books is an academic he he said you will never write that book i said why he said you don't have the time you're constantly taking phone calls you're constantly uh, you know doing other things and so i said so what should i do and he said get up in the morning and i said what time he said 5 am i said will you call me he said yes so i got up at 5 am when everybody else was sleeping and i would write and the entire complex was asleep except for those who work very hard they get up early and work but the interesting thing was i had the songsters the birds who were up so in my book on rabindranath tagore the biography in in the acknowledgement i thank the birds they were my inspiration Well, should be people say that music often transcends language. I'd like to suggest that your poetry
transcends and combines cultures, because it's quite remarkable. And I wonder if you would, as we move towards the end of the session, like to choose some other poems from Habitat, which I think you were looking at to read to us. Thank you, Ravi, for seeing trans transcending. What a wonderful thing to say. Um, I, how much time do we have? As long as you like. Perhaps no, no. we have about another five, five or ten minutes, yes, yeah. and then we'll conclude. I wondered if I could read a narrative poem, yeah? Um, we had a boy who would come on a bicycle. This was, we lived on a university campus, and he would have hens hanging upside down. And he would come and he would sell a hen to every house, and then he would go round the back and dress it and bring it back. But once, he didn't come. So this is the story of one of our family. You want to say which page it's on? If uh, you it's page 81. Okay. Pages from the memoirs of a battery hen. My first memory, as I told you, the birds speak in this poem, in this book a lot. My first memory is of a crowded, smelly place where my mother was indistinguishable from a harem of identical clacking women with very little space to preen or relax. We were a pretty competitive lot, scrabbling, squabbling for the food thrown at us without ceremony. As kids, we spent time getting out of other people's way afraid of being trampled by many feet. There was no question of playing fun games or scampering out to see the world. Every so often, enormous intruders came in to pick up some of my mum's friends with intent, and we'd never saw their beady eyes again. We had no dignity as we scuttled around eating, dressing, resting, shitting in that cramped space which was not much of a home. I lost mum one day when I was busy sampling grain. Then it was my turn, one rosy morning, when I was a full-sized lass, to be spotted and dragged off, my screams making no impression on my hard-handed captor. He passed me on to a young man who tied my legs and slung me with some of my pals to hang upside down like a bunch of bananas. The whole world was noisier than our room, as I saw it the wrong way round, from the back of a bicycle, as we dangerously coursed through busy streets, competing for space between bullying buses and trucks, impatient cars and tired rickshaws, each missing us by an inch as we were bumped through the frightening maze. We arrived finally where the ground stretched green and the air felt deliciously free, deliriously free and pain, playful. One by one, my mates were dislodged and disappeared. Finally, we stopped at a house with a garden that had more color than the rooster that trumpeted at dawn. I saw her soft sandals before I heard her mellifluous voice. This was my mother. Her sari folds were as delicate as her hands that chose me. The lad untied me from my mates and flung me by her. Gently, she urged. He laughed and promised to be back in an hour to dress me for her benefit. She unknotted the string. My stiff legs felt life drifting back. She smiled and picked me up and took me through the veranda into a roomed space that was cool and calm like her very presence. Her daughter was delighted, that's me. Her daughter was delighted to meet me and brought me some lentils, which I picked at cautiously from her palm after many urgent whispers. As I ate, my little pecks were echoed by her. She said, 
Kutush, Kutush, and that became my name. I loved the clean cement floor, the refreshing fan waves, and soon I was exploring all the rooms in this new place where I was the new star. The father watched me with amazement and amusement. He and the mother sat opposite each other at a table, surrounded by books, where I sauntered in every so often, cocking my head to check on each of them on either side, which always made them smile. As the days went by, I settled into a pattern. No longer cramped by jostling crowds, I roamed unhindered, admired by the daughter, lovingly caressed by the eyes of the mother. My food appeared like magic in a bowl that seemed replenished eternally, and beside it was a bowl of sweet crystal water. This was my paradise. Even their ginger cat, whom they called Marshal Lalu, eyed me from a distance, knowing a princess when he saw one. He slinked away unhappily, preferring an outdoor meal as I watched him from the dining room window. My favorite perch was the wash basin, behind a yellow wall, which I used as my own special toilet, which the mother kept meticulously clean after her eye had ruminated on it for hours. One day, the young man came back with a silver sparkling blade and told the mother he was ready to dress me that day, apologizing for not coming back the day he had deposited me. The mother said his services were no longer necessary anymore. Why, he asked, had she done the job herself? I peeked at him from behind her sari pleats, and he gasped in disbelief. She told him it was too late. Her daughter came out and picked me up. Kutush is part of the family now, she told him, as she stroked my orange crest. Even Marshall respects her. Doesn't he? She asked me. I crooned in agreement and looked directly at his startled gaze, confident in my newfound dignity, as he could not, that he could not take away from me now and forever in my new kingdom. That should be wonderful, Kim. <laughs> well, we've had a we've had a wonderful experience. You've guided us through your works. I know you're a great optimist, and we hope that there are others of future generations who will adopt poetry. They said of Winston Churchill that he marshaled the English language and sent it to war. You have marshaled the English language and given us all great amusement and clairvoyance and a super experience. So on behalf of everybody here, on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, Thank you. Thank you so much.